Put you over here. All right, guys, we are live. Hey. Patty, can you hear us all right? I can. All right. Peter, let's get it started. What up, Rebel fam? Welcome to this week's episode where we have real talk with dope people. Today we're back in the thick of it, bringing you to what we do best, giving you the realest education there is in cannabis from people of color. I am Peter, the director of knowledge at Rebel. Allow me to introduce my wonderful co-host, Lulu Sway. How you doing? Hey, Peter. Hey, Jacoby. Hey, Fatty. Um, I'm doing, I'm really excited about this episode. Um, Fatty is, I've known Fatty for over 20 plus years now. Um, and he and his group are the reason I'm in, um, in legal cannabis. So super stoked to have a member of my family um, on the show today. Jacoby, how you doing? Dude, I'm doing all right. Little does everybody <laughs> else know all the, the AV technical fire drill we just did for 20 minutes, but we <laughs> slid in right on time. So uh, I'm just happy to be here. Did it. We did it. All right, let's kick things off. The, this week, there's a lot of stuff going on. I think at the forefront, um, it's the reintroduction of the MORE Act that has a lot of people hopeful. Uh, the MORE Act in its previous forms have passed this, the House twice, um, where it just got killed in the Senate um, or didn't go anywhere. Um, now it's being introduced for the third time. Um, and so just to make some of you familiar with what stipulations are in the MORE Act, uh, there's a descheduling of marijuana from a controlled substance, um, which would open the way towards a lot of commerce um, and things like that on the federal level. Uh, they want to levy a federal tax. Um, I think the cap is 5%, but obviously um, it's to be determined, um, but it would introduce a federal tax um, on the sale of marijuana and related products. Um, there is a restorative justice component um, allowing the resentencing of those inmates um, throughout the country who are uh, convicted uh, for cannabis related offenses. Uh, it'll provide protections for immigrants um, who may have cannabis somewhere on their record um, and would normally be denied citizenship or residency um, because of such a record. Um, it would also prevent federal agencies from denying public benefits and security clearances to individuals who work with the federal government. Um, so there's a lot of good stuff in the MORE Act um, and hopefully it'll pass in some form. The Senate is working on its own bill um, to introduce for federal legalization um, with a more focus on small businesses, um, but that is to be determined. Uh, Senator Cory Booker and Senator Chuck Schumer are working on those two on, on that bill in the Senate. Um, and it is noteworthy to say that two Republican senators have a bill with just the descheduling of marijuana um, from the Controlled Substances Act or Controlled Substances uh, list um, without all the other stipulations for sort of justice and, and federal tax and stuff like that. Um, so there's potential that since that's lean and um, it might pass by itself. Um, so there's a lot of stuff going on. Um, what are, what's your guys' take on it? I mean, um, I like a lot of a lot of the things that you talked about from the MORE Act. I think it's really promising. Uh, I think last time it got killed in the Senate, if I'm correct, and that'll be the battle again. I don't know the best about, you know, I don't understand how the politics work the best and what's the, the best way to play this. But it feels like just descheduling it on its own is like a quicker way to success for like a ton of different reasons. And it also takes off the possibility of rescheduling which is a pretty risky thing for almost all the cannabis businesses that we know so um i'm kind of a fan of not clumping it all together and just seeing if they can just knock that one piece off because that just opens up tons of medical things it opens up potential for banking it, it just de-risks a lot of things for entrepreneurs
Yeah. Uh, so uh, another big news, uh, we're keeping things on the federal level today. Uh, we have Amazon that just announced support for the MORE Act and the fact that they will stop testing or pre-screening their employees for cannabis, um, which it, it's a big deal because we, as we know, uh, screening cannabis for a lot of jobs uh, disqualifies a lot of people, um, especially people who are patients who don't necessarily aren't necessarily enrolled in the medical system if their state has one. Um, but in addition to that, uh, it is just a major corporation. I mean, Amazon, I don't know, Walmart's still the number one job employer in the United States, but Amazon's gonna eclipse them soon enough. Um, so it's a big deal. And it'll definitely set waves for other businesses and changing the screenings um, processes. I, I know LabCorp probably isn't happy about it as that's a lot of business, but um, I think for the people, it's a win. I think it's kind of interesting to, um, you know, so Jacoby and I have both been in tech um, and met a lot of groups that are doing technology, especially in the delivery side, who are always like, we're going to be the Amazon of cannabis. So Fatty, you're near Seattle. Have you heard any um, rumors or anything about uh, Amazon getting into the cannabis delivery, at least regionally or locally, I should say? No, but I mean, ever since with all the COVID stuff and trying to find employees, I think it was uh, something that they kind of had to do because it's so hard to find good employees anymore. And so mm -hmm. I know that even in the restaurant industry, like hospitality and all that kind of stuff, it's, it's hard to find good people. So, you know, I'm staying at a Marriott here and they're actually getting people like uh, uh, overseas people coming over to work here. So it's uh it's interesting. Wow. Maybe yeah. in Salt Lake right now. Yeah. I was gonna add that same thing. I've been working with some other groups outside of cannabis that are trying to figure out how do we hire workers right now. And it's a lot cheaper to say, I won't test you for weed than to say I'm gonna give you two more dollars per hour. <laughs> and when you're looking for any possible way to to convince people. That's probably like the easiest hurdle for you. Yeah, true. Yeah, I mean, I definitely think it's setting a precedent that a lot of other companies are going to follow suit in. Um, so, I mean, for the reasons we discussed um, and many more. Uh, finally, on the federal level, uh, there's an argument prohibitionists like to use that once mar medical mar or once marijuana is legal in any form, uh, use is going to skyrocket amongst the youth. Um, and I am pleased to say today that uh, federal agency, the United, uh, the Education and Statistics Department um, released a study uh, looking at legalization um, and use rates amongst, cannabis use rates amongst teens uh, throughout the entire country um, with emphasis on places like Colorado and California. Um, and they unequivocally announced that there's no statistical difference and that there does not seem to be any measurable difference in cannabis use amongst teens, specifically high schoolers, nine to 12th grade. Um, and it's a self-reported survey. So I don't know how you guys felt when you guys did those in high school, um, but I don't know if it's the best kind of data, but the fact that it's still stable, um, it's, it takes a huge blow out of the prohibitionist argument. Um, even just today, I saw an article about poison control in upstate New York, having more uh, calls than ever about edibles and, and teens. And it's just like, it's not even legal yet. Like, what, what are, who are you trying to blame for this, if that's the case? Um, so yeah, it's a bit, it's a blow to the prohibitionist argument. Um, and it's great to see a federal agency uh, stick to the data and not try to like make a significance out of nothing. I mean, I, in theory, yeah, pretty cool. Um, if I was 17, did you smoke weed today? Check yes or no. I'm going to check. No, yeah. so I, I don't know how like strong that's going to hold up. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's just a matter of, I mean, not to poke holes in something that's in the, the argument, but I mean, let's be rational. I don't think a lot of these self reports from high schoolers are accurate to begin with, but I mean, if it's the best data we got, it's the best data we got. There's no other way to really do it. So. Yeah, I mean, cannabis 
uh, evangelists like myself and many people like to drink their own Kool-Aid, but sometimes we got to like, you know, call out the other side sometimes. Interesting report, the way that they came about the data, you know, arguable. Yeah. But cool. Thanks, Peter. Thanks for getting us started. Let's get into this episode. Uh, shout out to everybody that joined us on Zoom, the people that are on YouTube. Uh, shout out to our first like. I got a text that you got the first like on YouTube. I see you, Zach. Appreciate you. Um, but yeah, thanks everybody for joining. Um, we have a really good episode. Like Lulu mentioned, these guys go back. These two have been friends for a while and Fatty has a really cool story. Uh, and I'm excited to get into it. I uh, had the honor of hanging out with them uh, back when we used to do things in person uh, back in Vegas in 2019, I think. And uh, these guys are just blown up, taking over the game. And uh, I'm excited to learn a bit about it. So, Fatty, welcome and thank you for joining, man. How you doing? Thanks. Good. Uh, happy to be here. Uh, yeah, Lulu and I have been friends for quite a long time. Um, we were talking uh, yesterday about skeletons that are going to stay in the closet but um yeah a lot of good times and uh, uh vegas is always fun so you add a big party to it and there's a bunch Roots, of mayhem root sciences <laughs> throw one of the best parties um in las vegas for mj bizcon hands down um jacoby missed the first two years um he was distracted in vegas and uh he finally came and i think he had a really really good time um, and I just wanted to throw out that Fatty has always been a serial entrepreneur. So we actually met in college. Um, and Fatty, I met him through his brother, Nened, who's also a co-founder of Root Sciences. And um, so Fatty had a valet company. So he was always the hard worker. We would always park to go to the club. Um, Fatty would take care of all of our vehicles and, but he would work. And then afterwards, um, so he wouldn't miss out. He would throw the after party at his place. So that's how, but always, always making money. This guy. Yeah, uh, no, um, I started out doing valet when I got out of school and then, um, I ended up working for AT&T for like 15 years. I was a director there for network operations. And, uh, so I came from a technical background and and then uh, my brother and I and two of our friends from high school, we, you know, one of them says, you know, hey, maybe we should get into the marijuana industry, you know, it's going to go legal in Washington. And we were already playing around with medical and we're just, I, I told them, I said, uh, 15 years at AT&T, my brother had already been, you know, 10 years, 15 years in finance they had a construction company jim and jeff did so i said you're out of your mind what are you talking about and uh you know a few days go by and we get back together and, and we're like maybe it's not bad you know it's such a bad idea after all so we uh, put in an application and we got a we got a license in washington state it's a tier three license so um so we have a grow we do some processing there um in Washington, it's a little bit different than some of the other states. They're not vertically integrated, so you have to sell to a, a retailer. Uh, so we wholesale to a retailer uh, or a bunch of retailers. But uh, while we were doing that, you know, we did that in 2014 or something like that. I think that's when we got licensed. But um, we decided we needed extraction equipment, so we started doing CO2 extraction, and then we. Uh, wanted to get into distillation so we could do vape carts and and so we got a distillation plant and and that one kind of gave us problems and so we bought another one and then we bought another one and said there's got to be something else better out there right so we uh, my brother started looking uh, poking around and started researching and found a company in Germany that you know focused on distillation equipment and he uh, called them up and we got some technical people on the call and we said, well, we like your plant. We saw pictures of it and we said, we need you to make this change and this change and this change. And, you know, we took all the flaws that we saw out of other people's equipment and we kind of incorporated that into this new plant that the VTA built us and we got the plant and we started using it. And we're like, oh my God, this is like the next best thing to slice bread. And they said, but, uh, we said, why aren't you selling this in the in the cannabis industry? And, 
And, you know, they had reservations because of their parent company and it's a very large parent company. And then uh, it was, um, we don't know anything about cannabis. You know, why don't you go sell it? Well, we're not really salespeople, but okay, we'll give it a shot. So, you know, two months into it, we, we called VTA back. We said, hey, we need more machines. We're, like, you're not building them fast enough for us. And they said, we know. And we said, well, we need more. You need more glass floors. You need more, you know, you need more fabricators. And, and they said, yeah, we're working on it. And, um, and so it kind of spun off from there. So now we're a, a worldwide um, exclusive distributor for VTA for distillation equipment. And then we've kind of been moving off into other, um, other equipment, you know, such as extraction or uh, post-processing um, for, you know, nano emulsions or uh, isolates or like crystallization or filtration and stuff like that. So um, Root Science has started in 2016. Um, and so now we have a, a small group of people. We don't have that many employees. I think we have like 15 employees. Um, but yeah, kicking and coming up with new stuff and just trying to have fun at the same time. All right, man. So there's a lot I want to unpack there before we get fully into like <laughs> the roots business. Cause you just flew through that. Like it was easy, but I know it wasn't that simple. That, that's right, the so, nickel tour. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you guys, you guys had these pretty solid corporate jobs and another set of brothers that you guys were friends with for, you know, eternity had construction jobs. Like you guys were all okay from what it sounds like. And, um, you went into cannabis, you got a license. Like how much were you spending on machines as a business? And actually, did you guys even quit your jobs yet? Or was this like a side project? When did you quit? I had to quit my job when we started. I, I noticed that I was at work and I was researching like extraction equipment and greenhouses and, you know, lighting and stuff like that. Uh -huh. I was super, I mean, it's AT&T, right? And so I, I know that they, they have access to my computer and what I'm looking at my search history. So at some point I, I went to my boss and I said, this isn't working. I just got to go. And uh, I think that was in 2000. We weren't licensed by then. So I'd quit before we got licensed. Um, okay. But yeah, it's, 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 it was, you know, my brother did the same thing. So Naned quit just before me. He quit just before me. And then, uh, Jeff, he, I mean, he was an owner for the construction company. So he just kind of took a seat back and then, uh, and then Jim kind of still manages that company, but, um, but yeah, we have a very, um, diverse group of skills, you know, everybody kind of brings something to the table, you know, me from the, the technical perspective and my brother from the finance perspective and, you know, uh, Jeff from, you know, project management, um, Jim from, um, you know, running a business and, you know, keeping the books straight. When I was doing the books, they were all over the place and looked horrible. So, um, yeah, so we each brought something to the table, which made it really, um, really, it made it successful, right? So, so now, now we had to do other things. So now we, we as owners kind of took a step back. So we hired a CEO and a CFO and, a, you know, in-house accountant and all that kind of stuff. Right on. Okay. So when you guys had your license um, and then you saw the opportunity for selling machines instead, what happened with the license? What'd you guys do? We still have it. We still, uh, we still operate that company. So that company's in, uh, in Washington state, it's a tier three. Um, so you can do 30,000 square feet. Uh, so we do um, uh, cultivation, uh, processing and then we do bulk sales to retailers and then we do some toll processing but go ahead that's some companies called suspended brands so the brands in washington are suspended brands and clear mm -hmm. and they have to have like the dopest machines all the time i assume yeah we keep we keep on buying new machines just to try them out so one of the thing one of the nice things about having that licensed facility is that when we're doing r and d we can take that new equipment we can put it in suspended and go run it there and make sure that it's doing what we want it to do or um you know sometimes we'll j v with other manufacturers and you know have some of their equipment and we'll put it at the at our facility and 
you know, because people can't play with it because there's THC or whatever, unless they have some research license or whatever. So that's kind of how that worked out. Um, so it's really beneficial for root sciences to be able to uh, to test equipment and, and you know, really R&D them. Um, and then for suspended, they get to reap the benefits of it too, so. Yeah, so you guys had to level up your technical skills in a world that you probably knew pretty little about when you were first selling machines. How did you figure out there? I mean, I look at these machines and like my mind is blown by like all the little parts and I've literally run extraction machines and I'm still confused. And like, how did you guys get up to speed on all of this stuff in order to sell it? Uh, that was a, um, a feat feet to the fire type of thing it just it just happened um so when we bought the first plant uh we started we started running it um we ended up hiring a couple folks that were that got into the distillation game very early on um one of them we called the mad scientist but um so we we did hire some help to run the machines and then all of a sudden you know these technical support calls started coming in for root sciences and we worked with bta a little bit um you know to try to get their take on you know what might be causing certain issues or whatever so you know we got some knowledge that way but then while we were doing installations the installations were just going nuts and so i mean we were we sold 20 machines in like two months and so and so it was just uh, myself and one other guy, and we just had to, we just had to man up. And so we, we just, you know, we're going from city to city. Most of it was in California early on. I think we probably have like 300 machines in California or 250 in California right now. Um, and, you know, little things would happen during an installation or the next day they forgot how to run it or, you know, whatever. So technical support was definitely a big piece of it. Um, but it was just trial and error and just kind of doing the grind. All right. The, the grind makes a lot of sense with a business partner, but somehow I imagine that it's completely wild doing it with your brother. So what is oh it like my. working with your brother and your, your family friends? Lulu's laughing over there. <laughs> uh, I stayed, I stayed with them for about a year. And I actually lived with Nanette um, for about six months in Belfair, Washington, which is a tiny little city, a tiny little town, village, I could even say. Um, and uh, the communication style between brothers and friends is, is definitely um, something to remember. But yeah, Fatty, I'll, I'll let you answer that question. You, you definitely don't want to, uh, uh, being in meetings, if uh, Nanette's in those meetings, your your half an hour meeting just went to like three hours um definitely as a talker uh which i mean um i'm not taking anything away i mean that's a definitely needed and and you know he's the one that really kind of researched the distillation equipment the new equipment and found vta for us um so you know that's why he's kind of in charge of business development and i'm more in charge of r and d's <laughs> but it fits very well um at the end of the day we go home as brothers and you know we get along um uh but it does kind of test patience and um and nerves so sometimes one of us will walk out of a meeting room because we're so upset or whatever and we'll have a little argument and we go back in and we're fine so <laughs> it just kind of works out <laughs> jeff um jeff and jim don't have that kind of um clashing a little bit but i think it's because my brother and i are very different you know my brother's not technical at all and when it comes to you know business development and stuff like that you know he really excels at that uh jim and jeff you know being in construction they kind of both kind of did that and so they don't i don't think they have nearly the um that uh brother stuff that um nanette and i did but at the end of the day we're still brothers and and we have a good time afterwards. Um, but for Jeff, but what can I say about Jeff? Jeff, Jeff's interesting. Um, Jeff is it definitely is on Jeff time. So, and I hope these guys don't kill me for talking about this, but 
uh, Jeff's on Jeff's time. So um, you really have to, uh, he gets to, to set what, <laughs> how the day goes. <laughs> Uh, Jim is actually the most level-headed out of the whole group. So if we really need somebody to be like, to, to, to um, kind of be that, that uh, voice of reason, that would be Jim. He's like the mayor. We call him the mayor. That's right. The governor. Yeah. That was so the most PC the, the answer dynamic. I would have expected out of you. Uh, He's being polite. <laughs> He's being very polite. <laughs> I don't want to have a blanket party. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I can imagine it, it's uh, like a blessing and a curse working with uh, people you're so close with. Yeah, but it's, I mean, it's been so fun. I mean, for the past five years doing this, I, I wouldn't have, I have no regrets. Anybody that says you're going to get rich in the marijuana industry is, is smoking their own stuff, but uh, it's definitely been a fun ride. Yeah, and you guys are in a, a more profitable side of the industry, which is the picks and shovels, as opposed to hunting for gold. And it's still a, a hard race out there. Yeah, I mean, COVID uh, definitely took a toll. Uh, and so it's, I mean, it was interesting because on the, on the license side, on the um, cannabis sales, you know, that was, that actually increased, right? Because everybody's staying at home and having fun, but um, on the, on the equipment side and equipment sales, um, you know, I think that the, uh, the economy was definitely skittish. The investors were skittish. They didn't want to put money into something that was, you know, um, unreliable or, um, uncertain. And so, um, that definitely hurt our sales for, you know, uh, up until maybe, August or September of last year, uh, I think it kind of started picking up a little bit, but um, yeah, it was, it was scary for a minute, for sure. Um, all right, I'm going to switch it up on you now. So we've kind of talked about like how you helped bring Roots to be what it is today. Um, I want to understand what exactly your machines do. Okay, so we have a bunch of people, most of our people come from the East Coast, um, New York and New Jersey specifically. Uh, things are starting to ramp up there. We have a lot of people that want to do a lot of things. And I want to break down like, what exactly do your machines do and how have they evolved over the years? Sure. Um, yeah, so, so Root Science has started out with distillation plants. So distillation is kind of a, a it's almost like a tail end process. Um, I mean, the first process is the cultivation. You have to grow the plant, right? You have to get the biomass. And then from there, you do your extraction. And then from the extraction, depending on how you're extracting, you're going to have to do some sort of filtering, uh, de-waxing, something like that. And then, and then you go into distillation. Let's say if you're doing like vape pens or edibles or um, topicals or something like that, you can go into, uh, you do a distillate. And then if you wanted to go further, you can go into isolates. Um, uh, there's some other, you know, nano emulsions, but that's all more post-processing, right? Um, so from an extraction point of view, basically you're taking biomass and you're using some sort of, um, you can use solvents, so you can do solventless. So let's say solvents would be some sort of hydrocarbon like butane or propane or hexane or any of the ains, pentane, um, and or you could do uh, uh, CO2, which is carbon dioxide, or you can do um, ethanol. Um, ethanol, you can do like a warm ethanol. You can do cold ethanol. Cold ethanol has an advantage of not having to, to take out the waxes. And then you have the solvent lists. So those could be your, you know, bubble hash or um, rosin presses or... Uh, you know, things of that nature, right? Um, so there's different ways to do extraction. They're done, um, the, the different methods kind of give you a different product. Um, you know, so if you want something really high in terpenes and you want to use solvents for just scalability, um, then you may end up using, you know, like a butane or propane or some sort of blend. 
Um, if you're not really too concerned about the terpenes, let's say you're just doing bulk distillate for, you know, vape cartridges or something like that, then you'd probably be doing like cold ethanol or ethanol. Um, CO2 is good if you want to get some terpenes out of it. Um, CO2 extraction, I've, I've seen less and less of CO2 extraction. I've seen more really hydrocarbon and, and ethanol extraction. But, uh, so that's for the extraction side. And then uh, before you can distill it, you want to pull out the waxes. And so to pull out waxes, you're using um, uh, different filtering methods. Um, so, but there's a, a thing called linearization where you basically suspend your oil in ethanol, you create a mixture and then you freeze it. And then the reason why you're freezing it is to, is you're trying to clump the, the, the waxes together. You're trying to separate it from the rest of the oil. And then you run it through some sort of filter. So it can be like a, something as simple as a coffee filter or something as complex as maybe a, a membrane filter. Um, and then you're filtering out the waxes. Once you filter out, uh, filter out the waxes, then you can do you know, decarboxylation, which you're, uh, you're turning the THCA into THC. And uh, once you do that, then you can run it through a distillation plant. The distillation plant, really what it does is um, you're using vacuum and heat to, um, to distill. Uh, basically, you're boiling off the cannabinoids and then recondensing them and collecting them. And then you're leaving the rest as your, your garbage, the leftovers. And usually that's more your, uh, your proteins and, and plant matter, uh, organic matter that you're not interested in. So you get this dark brown oil to a nice golden yellow color. So it splits into two, right? You have the, the remainder of whatever biomass you had left. And then you have this like, in theory, very pure um, set of, like it's like a liquid set of cannabinoids, right? And that's yep. the distillate when people smoke in carts. That's the stuff that just goes raw straight into the cart. Yeah, and then you can go further and you can do a, um, you can do nano emulsion, which uh, nano emulsions would be more for like edibles or beverages where um, you're basically emulsifying. Um, you're using a surfactant, you kind of uh, mix the two together. Um, and then what you get on the, on the end is um, the droplet sizes of your, your cannabinoids are smaller. And so it increases the bioavailability. So as it gets absorbed into your body, it gets absorbed faster and more efficiently. Um, so they do this in, uh, they do this in like pharmaceuticals and nutraceuticals and stuff like that. But, um, but the, the idea is that it gets absorbed into your body faster and more effectively. And so, uh, you know, when you take an edible and it takes you, you know, an hour and a half to feel the, the psychoactive effects, you know, now you're feeling them in like 15 minutes. And the intensity is maybe four or five times stronger than it would be if it wasn't nano emulsified. So, when you see on the packaging now, you'll see a lot of edibles that will say nano emulsified on it. Those are the ones you kind of need to watch out for a little bit. Yeah, cut the dose in half, maybe. <laughs> that was a fantastic, like, beginning to end from flour all the way to, I'd say, the potential inputs for a product, right? Like, those are basically all the stopping points for, like, what you might put into a product. Yeah, so the only thing I, I guess I left out is the the concentrates that are more the the boutique or the craft concentrates. So, um, I mean, which can be done through a rosin press. You know, if somebody wants like you know live resin and they just want it pressed out and it's just nice goo that they can dab or whatever. Um, uh, propane extraction or a, like a propane butane extraction. Um, where they're really trying to preserve the terpenes and they're really trying to make a nice, you know, whether it's a shatter, or crumble or batter or whatever it is. Uh, so there's definitely uh, products that you, you, you may want that, that don't go through a distillation process. You wouldn't go through a distillation process for that. 
And what about like uh, terpenes? I know you kind of talked about stripping them out at a couple of different points. Like, how would you keep those? Um, there's different ways to do terpene isolation. So um, I think like the, the oldest and like kind of the most well-known method is, is steam distillation to, um, to, to pull off terpenes. Um, there's, there's one really bad result of doing this is that your biomass is wet. And so then you have to figure out how to dry your biomass. Um, and terpenes are uh, very low yields. You'll get like maybe one to 2% terpenes out of your, out of a biomass. And that's like good biomass. Um, so, uh, some people will do steam distillation. Um, there's another way that you can do it through CO2 extraction where, um, you run your CO2 extraction subcritical, so which means at a lower at a lower pressure and lower temperatures, um, and then you do that for the first part of the run, and you collect the terpenes, and then you continue your run maybe at supercritical, which is a much higher pressure, and then higher temperatures, and then you'll start pulling out the the cannabinoids. Um, so that's with uh, CO2. And then now people are starting to play around with uh, with liquid nitrogen and trying to pull terpenes off with liquid nitrogen because at the end of the day, the, the nitrogen is gone. It's not a liquid anymore, right? So um, there's no solvent. The material is dry. You can just go and take that material and just extract it now and go get your cannabinoids that you wanted for your distillate or whatever. So it's something that we've been uh, toying around with lately. I have a question, Fatty. Um... I, I, when you say like you're seeing less and less of CO2, it's interesting because what um, you guys have done over 400 plus probably installations and been into four diff 400 different facilities across the, the world for processing hemp and, um, and, and THC cannabis. But like when you say, oh, we're seeing less and less of CO2, that's kind of counter to what we're seeing in the marketing side of things, right? Because everyone's like, oh, it's CO2. We, you know, like all the brands that are like, it's natural, it's CO2. Can you explain a little bit like why that is? Yeah, so CO2 is always considered a safer, uh, so some people call it solvent less. There's a difference between solvent less and solvent free. And this is like a marketing thing, right? So. Um, but back in the day when um, maybe it was black market or gray market or whatever, um, people weren't testing for residual solvent. And so uh, if you're using butane or propane um, or ethanol or something like that, you'd have, you could have residual solvent left in your product and your end product that you were selling. And so somebody that was smoking it or whatever, eating it, whatever they were doing, um, they could be get you know, taking in this solvent. So, but once the legal market came about and the regulations require, you know, uh, residual solvent testing and it has to be below a certain, you know, parts per million or parts per billion or whatever it is, um, uh, it kind of, at least for me, it kind of um, negated the, the whole thing about um, CO2 is, is the safer alternative, right? Because now uh, it doesn't really matter. You're not going to have, you know, you're not going to have solvents in your hydrocarbon extract. You're not going to have it in your CO2 extract. Um, the one thing about CO2 extra extraction is that it does pull out more of the minor cannabinoids. So when people start talking about full spectrum and I wouldn't call it full spectrum, but it's broader spectrum <laughs> uh, uh, extract. So you'll have more of the minor cannabinoids, um, not just the, the THC or the CBD, but you'll have some of the other ones in there as well. You'll have more of them than you would as if you did like a, a hydrocarbon or ethanol extraction. Um, so some people like that, um, it, but it's a catch 22 as well, because when you put it out on the market, people want high THC. Well, when you're doing a CO2 extract, your CO2 extract automatically is gonna have a lower THC. If you look, took two batches of the same flour and you did one CO2 extraction and one, uh, let's say, you know, butane extraction, 
the butane extraction is going to have a higher THC content than the than the CO2. The CO2 will have may have a higher total cannabinoid count, but it would have a lower THC. And what about, you know, you talked about testing and stuff, um, but what about labs? Like we always hear that, you know, there's shady things happening in labs. Like um, how do you, what's your thought on that? I don't know if it's all shady. It's definitely, uh, there needs to be more standardization um, with testing. Uh, You know, I can kind of tell what a distillate is going to come out at by looking at it. Um, and so when a client calls me and he shows me a picture or something, he says, yeah, they're telling me it's 60%. I'm like, yeah, okay, well, have them retest it, right? So um, I don't, there are some good testing facilities out there and I don't wanna knock on testing facilities, but I feel like that there could be more standardization. Everybody comes up with their own standards. Um, you know, some of the equipment that people are using um, can't get to that high of a concentration. Uh, so then you have to kind of like use a formula and cut it by half and apply this formula back after you're done. And and then you kind of get a, a number. Um, but it's interesting because, you know, in the market, at least in Washington, if you have a, if you have a vape pen or a distillate that is, you know, 79%, you may, or uh, sorry, 89%, you might not be able to sell it because they want 90%, you know? And it's like just this hard number. It's, uh, it's just weird, 90%. I want a 90% or higher. That's what all my clients say. 90%, I need you to get it to 90%. Oh, okay. I don't know if I can, but I'll try. <laughs> that's 90% THC content, right? Correct. But that's what they care about because that's what the market wants, right? I mean, they just... They want high THC, high THC. So they think that if it's less than 90%, that it's a subpar product, but it might have a bunch of CBD in it, or it might have, you know, I don't know, THCV or CBG or whatever it is. So all the more reason why we need to deschedule cannabis so we can study all those other things. But uh, you guys have an interesting perspective because you're in many states and countries. And I'm curious if, if you have noticed some differences in like either consumer demand or even the way companies are thinking about the final products. Yes. Um, a lot of them are, uh, are looking for more of the broader spectrum type products. Um, I know in Europe, a, a lot of people are interested in CBN, um, THCV, um, even CBG. So there's, um, there is definitely, and look, I mean, some of these are few and far between. It's just interesting that there's more of these, uh, these companies overseas. And, you know, a lot of them are coming out of maybe Israel, Germany, that are actually looking for that type of stuff. The biggest thing that I see that that's going to affect people and I don't think it's going to be that far off is the certifications on the equipment. And so having GMP certified equipment, I think, and if it goes federally legal in the States, it's going to be a requirement, right? I mean, the FDA is going to be involved and and you're going to have to have equipment that you would use for some, you know, for pharmaceuticals. And so um, uh, I think a lot of people are going to, are going to see that they're going to have to start changing out equipment and stuff like that. But everybody in Europe asks for GMP. I don't, I don't know that we've sold one piece of equipment that wasn't GMP in Europe. Can you just kind of, Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. I was just saying, could you just give me like the dummy version of what's the difference of some things that are in market right now uh, that are not GMP and then like what upgrades would need to happen? Uh, How about just to be fair, I tell you what, what needs to happen (laughs) because I don't want to say, Oh, these guys aren't GMP certified or whatever. Uh, So GMP certification, basically um, it requires, there's a lot more documentation to it. It requires that the client, whoever's buying the equipment, they, they give their requirements to the manufacturer. The manufacturer takes that, mocks it up, you know, um, designs it, 
And then they go back and forth with all these checks and balances, right? And it really depends on the client and what their needs are. And it depends on what the regulations are for that country or that municipality or whatever. So it could be something as um, as weird as the, the inside of all the process lines, all the tubes where product flows has to be polished. Or it could be that um, you have to use food grade O-rings. Or it could be that um, you need to have 20% of all of the welds x-rayed. Or it could be that you can't do, uh, all the welds have to be orbital welding where they use this machine that does the welding for you. So that's kind of the, um, and, and really GMP, all it stands for is good manufacturing practices. And so it really depends on the client and the manufacturer and what they agree upon. And then whatever other um, regulations are there um, to actually make the product that they're trying to make. That I think so is... for a, for a, for a, sorry Lulu for a machine that's um, you know that would have two binders uh, we have machines that'll have two binders if it's a GMP machine it's more like ten or fifteen binders. I was just gonna comment like this is part of sometimes Nanette's brilliance of um, kind of like foreseeing things. And, you know, we have a lot of entrepreneurs who um, are part of our community and we're always trying to say, you know, work smarter, not harder. So sure. the fact that, you know, since the beginning, there's been all of these groups making new distillation machines, new extraction machines. Um, and you guys went through that. You guys used specific cannabis machines and realized, oh my gosh, this part broke. And because it's a new startup, we don't know when we're going to get that spare part. Um, yeah, I think when we did, um, we definitely have purchased equipment that was tailored, customized for cannabis. And I, you know, I don't think that's going to go away. Sometimes there's a necessity for that. I just, we just didn't want to reinvent the wheels. So right. with the distillation equipment, I mean, VTA, um, super awesome company, super experienced. They've been doing this and they've been making distillation plants for 50 years. Uh, uh, one of their biggest ones, uh, one of their big ones is in Washington state. It's uh, they do distillation for mint oil. And, you know, this thing is, you know, six stories tall. So uh, it also is, you know, probably close to 10 million bucks, but, um, and they're the biggest supplier to, to one of the most popular toothpaste companies. But um, so we went to VTA and we said, hey, we know what the problems are with distillation plants for, for cannabis. Let's put all these fixes in there. So do this, do that, do that. And so we took something that was very, very, you know, fundamentally sound. And then we had them build on that. And it worked really well for us. Um, for the extraction equipment, we did the same thing. So for uh, for our cold ethanol extractors, um, we found a company in Germany um, that that uh, we went to them and had them design a, an extractor for us. And and that one's kind of unique because it's kind of an all-in-one. So it does your uh, your extraction, your solvent recovery. Um, you don't have to de-wax because it's so cold and then you're decarbing, decarboxylation, and it's all done in one machine. And then on the other end, you just put it into the distillation plant and you can distill it. So uh, uh, we're trying to take um, equipment that's already out there, that's already been proven, and just make those needed modifications to to make it work with cannabis i mean cannabis is super viscous super sticky um it can gunk up a pump like you wouldn't believe so um, those are kind of things that you have to take into account and just kind of find solutions for can you give us an idea of um like how much like taking like 10 pounds of flour and running through the process like how much distillate you would get from your machines 
It's a loaded question because it depends on the quality <laughs> of the biomass. <laughs> um, but on average, so I could tell you at our facility, um, it's a roughly about 10%. So 10% of your biomass comes out in, in distillate. And how many vape carts? So how many grams would that be? Uh, it depends on how many liter. you do because it's a because it's a, well if you took one one liter or one kilo you would get one thousand uh, grams or one thousand vape carts uh, if those were one gram vape carts or you'd get two thousand if they were half gram vape carts and then you have one liter would probably take you so one liter would take uh, about two hours on our smallest plant. For and distillation. Now you, you guys have grown. That before it was just the that one those size. Are, those are the yeah, those are the small ones now. That's that's a that's that's the little guy. <laughs> now they go now they go up to uh 50, 50 liters an hour. Wow, fifty liters an hour. That's... Yeah, but that one that one's uh that one's you know that one has a mezzanine, so it's you know probably fourteen feet tall. Um, and then that one's a dual stage. So it does your first pass and your second pass at the same time. Yeah. And, um, what about what you're seeing for kind of predictions of what's going to happen, um, in the East coast for, um, production and processing? Uh, you know, so the East coast has always been so forward in all these other industries with fashion, with finance, with all this stuff. Right. Uh, the East Coast has always lagged when it came to cannabis <laughs> by like a couple of years, right? Compared to like California, let's say. So um, I think that, you know, first they have to get growing under their belt. I'm sure so many people are having problems with growing. It's not even funny. So I remember they have to going to that. Inst I remember going to that facility with you for that install. Yeah. And I was like, this is like a multi million dollar facility for cultivation and you're doing this type of growing and seeing the plants and seeing the mold and no mm -hmm. one had considered, wow, there's humidity here on the East Coast <laughs> that our, our person that we hired didn't think of because they came from oh. the West Coast. So yeah. Or they didn't definitely. or they didn't size their HVAC correctly or they didn't uh, consider, you know, CO2 burners or, you know, the so I think that's the part that they're gonna they're they're doing that right now, right? They had a couple crops you know, under their belt, they're, they're trying to figure it out. Uh, so I think that's the first part. And then once that happens, then they'll start moving into um, the extraction piece. And then I just, it's a, it's a progression, right? And they're just gonna have to work down the line, figure out what their issues are, fix that, and then move on to the next one. And just it's kind of just like an assembly line and get it all, get it all figured out. So I think it's going to be a, a little while longer, but you know, it really depends on what happens with on the federal side. If if uh, if it's legalized federally, then you know you're going to start seeing a lot of bigger companies coming in. You're going to see consolidation, a lot of acquisitions, a lot of mergers. Uh, so it's uh, it's scary, but it's also exciting at the same time because it could be some really cool stuff that happens. But. What's on the um, roadmap for you guys? What's coming up for Roots in the future? Oh, can't can't tell you all that. Uh, <laughs> so we are working on a, a, a terpene extraction um, uh, equipment um, that looks really promising. Uh, I have a couple of vape carts that are that are at the office that I haven't gotten to try because I haven't been home to get them, but. Um, so I'm excited about that. And then um, uh, the nano emulsification stuff is, is starting to take off. There's a lot more, um, there's more companies that are interested in nano emulsification, um, especially from a, from a medical standpoint, just because you can, you can get that concentrated, you know, um, the increased bioavailability. So uh, that's great. And it's not even, it's not really that expensive of a machine. I mean, compared to like a distillation plant, you know, the cheapest distillation plant we have is like 140,000. Um, these nano emulsification machines are like 40,000 or something like that. So 
Um, but I see some great benefit there. Um, and then, uh, yeah, we're always looking to partner up with other people, um, like-minded people, doesn't necessarily have to be in manufacturing or, um, or equipment. Uh, it could be more process driven. Um, so there's definitely stuff that, I mean, we're always keeping our eyes and ears out there to see um, who else is out there like root sciences that we all can benefit from. All right, so we are just about out of time. I really, really appreciate you uh, checking in with us. Um, one other question for you, just thinking about the future of cannabis and ultimately the products that we're consuming. If you were to take a guess at <clears throat> the next five years, the next 10 years, um, actually, let's take a step back. Looking back five years ago, flour was king and there's like these weird dab heads that were all into like butane hash, right? And that slowly has changed and became more kind of um, consumer friendly. What's the next five to 10 years uh, look like for products? You know, um, I think flour, that's always going to have a, a, a special spot in people's hearts. So um, I think flour is always going to be um, kind of on the, the forefront. Um, I think that um, terpenes is a, a very hot thing right now. And especially with all this stuff that happened a year ago or two years ago or whatever it was, I don't even remember anymore with um, adding fake terpenes and stuff like that. So that's why we're really excited about the terpene extraction um, to be able to pull cannabis derived terpenes and to reintroduce those into your vape cart. So you have a much more cleaner vape cart that's not um, adulterated with you know, terpenes from, you know, Alibaba or whatever, wherever they're getting them from. Um, and then the um, nano emulsification is a hot thing because of, um, you know, that's not just for edibles and beverages. You can put those on for the transdermal patches, for, uh, for pain management, for, you know, from the medical side. I mean, there's so many um, there's so many different possibilities, um, to help people. And, you know, without getting too much into it, uh, my dad is a retired doctor, but he still practices for friends and family and, and he's actually treating a kid. And, you know, this kid has a very rare form of, uh, epilepsy. He was having like a hundred seizures a day and now he has less than 10 and he can actually see his parents and laugh at him before he was just like looking through glass or whatever. So, uh, it's, um, I'm very excited about that. Right on. Uh, well, like I said, man, we really appreciate you taking the time. Uh, it's been a while since we've seen you in person, but uh, you know that we're going to be looking for October. <laughs> Let's make it happen again. Vegas. Um, yeah, man. Really great. To, re really great to have you on. Uh, shout out to everybody that joined us on zoom, everybody that's on YouTube everybody watch that watches the podcast or YouTube later. We appreciate you. Uh, Lulu has been busting her ass to get us a full lineup throughout the summer. So we have um, a lot of really cool people booked for this season and we're excited to, to share them with you. Lulu, do you want to give them a, a preview of next week? So next week um, we're featuring Geraldine Cueva. Um, also known as Gigi. She's um, been in the cannabis space since the very beginning and is just a powerhouse, um, aka the philanthropist. So I'm um, really excited to talk to her. It's been a while. I haven't spoke to her in a while. And she's worked with so many brands that, you know, that are very um, prominent in the cannabis industry on the consumer side. So get her take on everything. Um, and thank you, Fatty. I miss you and hopefully we'll see you in person sometime soon in Mexico. Miss you too. Let's do it. And I think you stuck. <laughs> I think that was you, Lulu. I think we're all firing. We lost you at the end, Daddy? <laughs> which is ironic because of how much fatty had to do to get that internet. Right. <laughs> well, actually, do you see where I'm at? I'm right next to the bar. <laughs> Sounds about right. <laughs> Uh, if That's you were right, on YouTube, the green room. if you guys were on YouTube, 
press the like if you like this. Help us out. Uh, other than that, Fatty, appreciate you, man. We'll talk to you later. Thanks, Thank Fatty. You. Bye. See ya. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.